All right, hello and welcome to another Expert Inside interview. My name is John Golden from Sales Pop, online sales magazine and Pipeliner CRM, joining you as usual from San Diego. And today I am delighted to welcome Taft Love, who is in Austin, Texas. Hey, Taft. John, great to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, and Taft is a former police officer and federal investigator, so we all better behave ourselves today, uh, turned sales operation leader, and Taft has built a sales, sales development operation team for high growth startups like PandaDoc, Smart Recruiters, and DocSend. Uh, today, Taft leads sales team at Dropbox while also advising and sitting on the board of Iceberg RevOps, a RevOps consulting firm he founded to serve high growth startups. And that's what we're going to talk about today, actually, is uh, we're going to talk about RevOps because uh, RevOps is, I think, Taft, I mean, there's so many terms that keep cropping up. I remember once upon a day, time, there just used to be sales, right? It was just the sales organization. Yeah. You had sales and you have RevOps, you have revenue and you have all sorts of stuff going on. So let's focus in on RevOps because I think today Rev, RevOps means different things to different people. And to some people, they don't even know what it means. So let's start off with your definition. <laughs> yeah. Uh, RevOps generally means whatever the company or person saying the word wants it to mean. Um, <laughs> my definition is a centralized function that manages operations. And I think of that as being three pillars. There are systems, strategy, and enablement. Uh, those three pillars combined under a single umbrella that does not report into its clients. So sales ops lives within rev ops and doesn't report to the VP of sales. Marketing ops lives in rev ops and doesn't report to the VP of marketing. And so a truly centralized function that does the various elements of operations that used to report into their clients, which is not always a problem, but in a lot of companies created problems, um, especially in terms of conflict of interest. Yeah. So, I mean, under if you want to move to a model like that, I mean, what is, what is the way, how do you, how do you sell that? Because obviously let's face it. I mean, a lot yeah. of companies, is traditionally like sales don't want to give up anything marketing doesn't want to give up every every everybody always thinks if it's reporting if it's directly in my group then i have control over it how do you get to this kind of where you can centralize functions that that traditionally have belonged to departments yeah i, I don't think it's necessarily the right answer for everyone mm -hmm. i think some things to look for when deciding whether you should even consider revops are uh, the biggest one is, is your go-to-market strategy one that requires uh, uh, that requires collaboration across different departments and shared tools and where one person or, or one group, like the VP of sales, being the de facto owner of operations, has significant cost for teams up and down funnel of them? That's, a, that's where you should probably consider going the RevOps route. You're right. Sales rarely wants to give up operations if they have sales ops and everything. Marketing ops is sort of a branch of the sales ops team. At smaller mm -hmm. startups, you often see marketing ops is like what the Salesforce administrator does when they have some free time. Yeah. Um, so this is something that generally has to come from outside of the client, uh, the client divisions, departments mm -hmm. that... Uh, uh, who RevOps would serve. And so generally this comes from a chief executive or chief operating officer who says, hey, I'm tired of not trusting the, the data that I'm receiving. I'm tired of us all not rowing in the same direction. And one of the biggest things is I'm tired of nobody being focused on our customer first. I'm tired of nobody being focused on the experience of our customer, which spans the funnel from somebody who first hits your website to the 10th time a customer renews. Um, none of none of these sub uh, sub operations units that aren't tied to RevOps generally think deeply about how that customer experience is. Where RevOps is generally incentivized to do exactly that. Yeah, yeah, which is which is is, is what should be happening because as you as you rightly point out, I think people are waking up to the fact that customer experience starts from the first time they interact with your with your brand all the way through the sales cycle, onboarding, custom, all of that to, you know, renewal and all of that. And if you're not having a consistent experience, then unfortunately, human nature being what it is, you always default to the one bad experience. You can have 20. It's, I always use the example, like you, could, you can fly 
you can get to the airport on time, you can get checked in, you can have a lovely flight, everything's smooth, arrive in early to the gate, you're feeling great, and then your bags are delayed, and guess what? It suddenly it turns into the worst journey of like flight you've ever had, even though everything <laughs> then was perfect. Yeah, it's the old, uh, you build a thousand bridges, you're a big bridge builder, you screw one sheep. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. <laughs> I love it. I got to buy that one. Um, and, and the, other, the other thing I want to talk to Taft about why this is becoming, you know, RevOps is becoming more important because if we if we start just on systems alone, right? I mean, yeah. every organization nowadays, I mean, you have to have a lot of technology systems. Or not, I wouldn't say a lot, but you have to have some core technologies like CRM and all of that. But what we've seen now is a kind of wild west where there's so many sales, so-called sales and sales enablement tools and those coming out that people are even doing a la carte and individual sales people like signing up for tools uh, you know that maybe one person's using one thing one's another and it can start to get chaotic and none of them work together and uh and that's why i think a, a big driver of revops has been this whole thing of getting a handle on systems and on tech on software yeah systems has has changed probably as much as stra strategy and more than enablement i think in the in the past 5 to 10 years and what I see, what I've seen happening is you back up 20 years and Salesforce was, had this, this vision of being your, Salesforce really started doing what HubSpot is doing today, like the one-stop shop for all things sales and marketing. Mm -hmm. And they pretty quickly figured out that, no, we actually need the, uh, need the exchange to allow people to write to our API and build products on top of Salesforce. And we're really going to be the hub that connects you to all these other tools mm -hmm. at, because the market decided in aggregate, we want best in breed and everything. We don't want to do mass emails out of Salesforce. We want to buy outreach. We don't want to use exactly for yes. our, uh, for our commissions. We want to use a, a third party tool that, uh, uh, that makes it easier to, uh, to build commission plans and for reps to see their commissions and on and on and on. And now we have, you know, the average, uh, uh, across the iceberg customers, we see 10, 20, 30 tools plugged into Salesforce. And you've also seen that tools span functions, you know, back in the Glenn Gary days, if you remember mm -hmm. that movie, one of the scenes, sure. the, the manager walked in with a bunch of cue cards and marketing had passed leads to sales and marketing was done with its job. Yep. And yeah. marketing's off to get new leads. And that's no longer the paradigm. Now the paradigm is they all have to work together. They share tools. You look at tools like Sixth Sense that span the entire funnel and somebody has to manage them. And now the the old paradigm of sales operations manages sales tools, like it doesn't fit the way the world works today. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I would I would totally agree with that because uh, the only way things are effective today is if there's some level of integration. So your marketing automation needs to work with your sales, with your sales stack. So does your your support, uh, you know, your customer support, your ticketing systems, all of they all need to be and to be honest, accounting systems, uh, ERP systems, all of that. In most companies, if you're going to be efficient, they need to be talking to each other. So, to your point, you can't really use you can't really uh, use the standalone argument anymore. <laughs> yeah, a hundred percent. And companies, especially smaller businesses, I, I see more and more large companies actually investing in revenue operations as a function. But smaller businesses, this is sort of the niche that that uh, iceberg fills is mm -hmm. these businesses that are have graduated founder selling, but don't yet have the million dollars a year to, to build a, a qualified revenue operations team, they're stuck and they're drowning in the, we call it operational debt because they have 10, 20 tools plugged into a CRM that isn't, isn't functioning well on its own. And it's a, it's a nightmare. It's, it's really hard to get right early on. Yeah. And I guess that in some ways, I think that, uh, that, that leads into this, into the strategy piece too, doesn't it? Because I mean, and I think, unfortunately, I think a lot of people are led by technology rather than strategy and looking at where the need is and what it's going to be. Because we, I think the shiny new toy syndrome, I think, has gotten out of control. It was always there, but there's so many tools coming out. And we haven't even talked about AI yet. But so I, pulling back for a moment and and developing a strategy for, for your revenue operations, it's so, it's so critical. But I feel like that often comes like the cart after the horse. 
Yeah, it's before, uh, sorry, I got that wrong. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're right. Cart before the horse. There, you get. Uh, and, and I think it's the way I, I sort of look at this is you have, especially in in the tech industry at large, you have thousands of founders who a don't have a lot of experience project mm -hmm. managing and building st complex strategies for business who have built tools that they say solve problems and they're all selling these tools to each other and of course when you're telling other people your tool is a solution to a business problem um you know ignoring the the realities of the business itself then like you're probably likely to believe the same pitch from other people and I don't know how many startups we work for that we step in and yeah, they've got three different tools that all do roughly the same thing, but each one sort of pitched itself as a solution to some hotspot we're trying to, to deal with at the, at the time that they were pitched. And yeah, nobody has, nobody has sort of hit the pause button and said like, what are we actually solving for and what's the goal we're working toward and where do we want our business to be before we decide which tools help us get there? Yeah, yeah, and 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 the tools that we eventually pick, do they operate well together? Are they are are there certain redundancies, etc.? Yeah, because I, yeah, I think I mean I, I'm talking to people today, and their sales stacks are just growing exponentially, and they're kind of losing <laughs> losing control over it because they're so they're so anxious to they get sold by the marketing of a lot of and a lot of them are point solutions too. A hundred percent. I don't know how many times I, I've had this conversation with founders who, especially, uh, so for some context here, Iceberg was uh, was me the first year and a half before I started hiring a team and eventually hired a CEO who runs it today. And so if I've had this conversation once, I've had it a hundred times, which is a founder says like, okay, we, uh, we like this idea of sales outbound software. What's better, sales loft or outreach? Yeah. And that's the cart before the horse in a big way and and kind of changing their mindset there and saying like time out what's what's the strategy is this we don't i don't even know yet if we're doing outbound or responding to inbound interest or something else and so yeah it's it's so easy to to start with the as you said the like shiny object the the cool tool that does something you didn't know existed a week ago and now you want to you want to put it in place and let's skip all the eating your vegetables and get right to plugging in this cool thing and of yeah. course, as everyone has experienced, fast forward six months and you have a complete mess on your hands. Exactly. Exactly. And I think it also then plays into the enablement part too, because if you if you have all these pieces of technology in place, you know you've got a bit, number one. You've got to, as you said, you know, have a strategy for how you're going to use them. Then you're also going to have to teach, train, and enable the the sales team or the revenue team to actually use them because what happens a lot of the time is you know you get you get an initial bump from a tool and then suddenly like you find that one person's using it now nobody else is but it, and it because maybe they've never been trained properly or there's no process in place like there's no management process in place to 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 oversee how it should be used there's this uh there's this thing I uh, used to do as part of onboarding for for Iceberg, and and it was this concept I I taught. And you, uh, you know, given your connection to the CRM market, I think this will this will resonate with you. But uh, the name Iceberg came from the idea that you know so much of of your systems are beneath the surface, and mm -hmm. what you normally see is records and reporting. And so reporting is is where I focus for this sort of uh, analogy is the wrong word, but this explanation of, of the idea that reporting is, the, is a great proxy for how healthy your systems are if they're, mm -hmm. they're always accurate, and, uh, but they're not always trustworthy. And the more tools you plug in and the more tools that are pushing data into your system and manipulating the data in, in the giant database that is a CRM, um, the more likely it is to not be trustworthy because for your data to be trustworthy, you have to have the right filters put on the reporting you're looking at. And beneath that, you have to have the right fields and meaning like the right type of fields to capture data the right way. And then beneath that, reps have to be doing what you expect them to do with the uh, with whatever you know UI they're using. And that could be outreach or mm -hmm. pipeliner or Salesforce or HubSpot or whatever, whatever UI they're in has to be, they have to be using it the way you expect them to. And then 
you have to be, you have to expect them to use it in the right way. And if any one of these pieces of the chain of data trustworthiness is broken, you don't have trustworthy data. You, you can't run your business as well as you could if you had, if you had data that you trusted. And that, that, those last two pieces, the enablement piece, the like, are you telling them the right thing to do and are they doing it are huge and so easy to skip. Yeah. And I think, and unfortunately, you start off with a bit of a deficit here because I think most people don't expect the data to be correct, almost because we've, you know, we've been through so many poor experiences in the past that it's almost like you're starting, you have to almost convince people that it's, it's this time we've gotten right. Therefore, again, if you leave it to people on their own, that's not going to happen. Um, well, let's talk about that, that, that other uh, great uh, uh, spanner thrown in the, in the works right now, and that's AI. How, how do you think AI is going to impact sales enablement? Because already people are going off the deep end thinking that this is going to actually replace sales, which is nonsense, but that's yeah. all. Okay. Um, I think the first thing we have to do is define what AI is, and I'm, I'll, I'll be the first to say I'm not an expert in this, and I'm, I'm not the one who should be claiming to have a good definition of AI, but one thing I've seen is, and I personally get confused with this, everyone says their tool is an AI tool. So many companies use .AI in their domain, and what I see a lot of is there, there are a lot of companies claiming to, to have AI as part of their technology that that I think probably doesn't meet uh, a real definition of AI. In enablement specifically, a lot of tools years ago started building features that said, surface the right content to your reps at the right time. And yeah. it'll look in your CRM, look at the opportunity and decide what you should be sending based on you know the size of the opportunity and their location and, and uh, industry. And when you actually peel back the layers, you figure out like, actually, this is some basic logic you you manually, a uh, human programs into the, you know, if then statements programmed into the back of a, uh, of a tool. And so I think a lot of what we're calling AI is not AI. However, I do think AI is gonna, gonna make sales reps a lot more effective. And I think it might be a game changer in the sense that I, I think a lot of, of your listeners and viewers will will feel this outbound especially the the top of funnel has just gotten so awful in the sense that we're spray and pray spam uh emails and and calls are are just flooding us and i don't know how but i i am i have a a deep suspicion that ai is going to help us start filtering some of that away yeah. and sales reps much more effective who who use AI sort of as a sidekick for doing prospecting and follow up throughout the whole sales funnel. Yeah, and I think that's uh, no, I I would agree with you, but I think that's the essence, isn't it, uh, of of um, RevOps at the end of the day, anyway, isn't it? It's the it's to help salespeople to be more effective and to focus on the high value activities and give them the tools and the support that they need. So that you can get the best out, and that's why I feel like AI is not going to replace salespeople. It may at a very like transactional level, but I think the benefit of it is going to be to allow people to be more informed, but also to to really engage in the relationship building and the high value activities, and get away from any of the mundane or repetitive or rote tasks. A hundred percent, and and even independent of AI, I think that's the way the world has been yeah. moving for for top of funnel as much as anything. I wrote a, a thing on LinkedIn, one of one of the LinkedIn articles I wrote, the the future of, of the BDR function. Mm -hmm. uh, I think this was a year or two ago. The whole idea was a few years from now, and, mm -hmm. and I think the transition is happening now, the whole BDR function is gonna fundamentally change because just high volume, crappy outbound is less and less and less effective. And the teams that will win are the ones that up level the BDR function and, and allow them to focus on actually selling and finding finding the the how to drive value for the a smaller number of higher value targets out there and um, and I think AI is just going to speed that up even more. Yeah, no, I I, I agree with you because I, I think just as sales tools are developing, so are customer tools, and and you know, we're going to be able to filter out and stop all, stop noise um, very soon. So if you're if that's your strategy is just to be volume and just like overwhelm, <laughs> um, there's going to be tools that are going to block you out and you're going to be gone. 
yeah, look at look at Gated, and and I'm sure there are others that are uh, that are really helpful. I mean, I I'm a sales guy, and I use Gated, and uh, and it's it's really helpful for me to to sort of get rid of people who are unlikely to be a good uh, somebody. I'm actually going to respond to in my inbox, and I don't even know if Andy and his team are using AI, but but it's already really effective. And I imagine if not layering an AI will make it even better at its job. No, absolutely. Well, listen, thanks a lot, Taft. This is a great insight. Uh, all of Taft's information is going to be below this video. But before we go, please do tell people a little bit more about you and what you do. Yeah, yeah. So I'm uh, uh, the head of sales for the uh, API program at, at Dropbox, as well as Docsend. Um, and then I'm the the founder of Iceberg RevOps. And so if you're a, if you're a startup founder or early VP of sales or VP of marketing, and you need help with revenue operations, uh, come talk to us. We're uh, we're happy to help. Yeah, absolutely. And I would uh, encourage people to to check out uh, to check out Taft to check out Iceberg because I, I'm telling you, there's there's so many tools out there. There's so many, it's becoming so easy that you could just end up with a, a, a spaghetti junction of uh, or a pretzel or whatever of, of tools and different people using different things. And you end up spending a lot of money, wasting a lot of time and not getting the results that you thought you would. 100%. So I encourage you to go check that. So thanks again, Tav. Thank you for watching, listening, and I'll see you all again very soon. Thank you.